Privet Katila Wandungruski Desu, and today I wanted to present to you Immigration, an American Story. This video is a comprehensive guide to immigration viewed from an American lens, though throughout this video I will make some references and arguments that apply to other countries as well. In this video I hope to explain the history of immigration to the United States, the current immigration regime and its effects on America, and some moral arguments against the current immigration paradigm. And at the end of the video, I hope to showcase a set of policy proposals that a mainstream populist in America can take that runs well with the public and can actually fix a lot of our current immigration problems. So before I do that though, I need to advise you, like I have a few explanations for you before I start the presentation. Uh, first and foremost, I am an identitarian. And my primary goal in, in the political sphere, so to speak, is to ensure self-determination and national sovereignty for all the peoples and nations of the world. And it is my fundamental belief that the current liberal international order of mass-scale demographic transfers is my main enemy, what I'm mainly combating. It's what my whole channel is basically about. And this is the lens of which I view immigration. And secondly, the second part I want to explain is that America is the best case scenario for immigration advocates to go for. It's the best. If you want to talk about being pro-immigration for any country in the world, you could always point to America. In fact, a lot of pro-immigration advocates in Europe point to America as a good example of immigration. Um, so be because technically being American doesn't require a certain race or ethnicity. It's not like exclusive. Like, you know, being French means something. Being Danish means something. There's a certain Danish people. America isn't quite exactly a certain specific race, so to speak. Also, we generally immigrants assimilate relatively well over a few generations, better than most other nations. They also don't use as much welfare, and they don't commit as much crime. But I will show, how, however, even in the best case scenario, the best nation of immigration, I will still show how it is still in America's interest to restrict immigration. I want you to keep in mind that in, that in places like Europe, for example, immigration is so much worse. Um, so we're dealing with the best nation from a pro-immigration point of view. Um, so this is the best case scenario for um, the pro-immigration um, advocates. So without further ado, here is Immigration, an American Story. So we've been told from all from our education system, from the media, and to the politicians themselves that America, I mean, I think you've heard this before, that America is a nation of immigrants, right? You know, you see it in the memes, like, for example, of that, like, Indian-looking guy or Indian dude who says, like, if you don't like immigration, get out, you know, that type of thing. So when arguing for looser immigration laws, one of the biggest cases pro-immigration proponents argue in America is that we have always allowed mass amounts of people to arrive on our shores. You know, that we are all descendants of immigrants, and unless you're a Native American, you are a hypocrite for wanting to restrict for those who want, who comes in. Now, they've been trying to extend that argument to Europe, which is an absolutely lie. So, you know, like, they've been arguing, like, oh, London, like, England's a nation of immigrants, which is, it doesn't work as well. But in America, it's, like, the most premier argument for pro-immigration people. Um, but a few questions first. First of all, Native peoples, the, the Native Americans, migrated to America from Asia. And so, I mean, does that mean they are immigrants? And that means they don't have a right to have the land that they inhabited before the Europeans? I mean, you know, they migrated here a few tens of thousands of years ago, So that does, but they migrated somewhere, so does that mean that this land isn't actually theirs? And second, Native peoples fought amongst themselves, you know, within this land, for, and the victors always got more land for themselves. So did the land that they take make them immigrants to that land? Um, and some leftists would actually say, well, actually, the whole, see, the whole point why I'm making this argument is that, you know, if you look back a few thousand or a few tens of thousands, a few hundred years, you know, um, you know, they're all immigrants. Everyone's an immigrant. You know, we all descended from Africa. And uh, But if you notice, the point of that argument is to deconstruct an identity. Basically like, well, you know, you see, a few hundred years ago, your ancestors moved to this area from another area. Thus, the current state and identity of your country is invalid. This is obviously absurd. And it's a spit to the face of the people who have had families here for 300, 400 years, who don't even know where they come from. 
and it's an even bigger disgrace when talking about people whose roots are in the country for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, like in Europe. But what if the people who came over are the ones who did create the future country, the ones who are known as like the first original stock? This is the setup for the first stage of the immigration story to America, which is the era of settlers and pioneers. So, sorry to Leif Erikson, the Viking, but the event that opened the old world to the new world is generally seen in 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and basically landed somewhere in the Caribbean. Now, from this moment, the new world was open. However, for our purposes of Amer the American story, we must zoom past about 100 years later, um, actually a little longer than that, a little over 100 years later, 1607. Where the first permanent English settlement in the future United States, Jamestown, was created. Also, a little later in 1620, a colony in Plymouth Rock was established. So, over the course of the 1600s, more colonies were founded, and a lot of the people who came over from England and everywhere came for a lot of reasons economic opportunity, trading opportunity, adventure, um, religious freedom, things like that. And hundreds of thousands came over. And most of these were from Britain, but there was also French, there were Scots-Irish, there were Dutch, and there were Swedes. Um, and also there were black, there was black Africans that came as slaves, mostly to the southern part of the United States. Now, tons of colonies failed, many perished. You know, the Indians there refused to see that diversity was their strength and massacred a lot of the first colonists. But through the 1600s, the population blossomed. You know, they built their own farms, they built up their own towns. They, they found their own way of government through their own back-breaking labor and their own drive. Um, so before the Revolutionary War, before the nation of America, when all this was going on, this wasn't immigration at all, actually. To be an immigrant is to immigrate to a pre-made nation. There was no pre-made nation that they moved to. They settled untamed and wild lands. For example, they've been, um, you might be wondering, where's all the Indians? Well, don't the Indians occupy this place? 90% of all the immigrants, before even the first colony of Jamestown was even established, died of disease. This would have happened because if, you know, Asians came first or Africans came first, but Europeans were the, one of the first, and they're the ones who, um, uh, it wasn't like some premeditated genocide. It was just the natural consequence of separate peoples meeting it up, not having being resisted. So 90% of all, all the Indians were dead um, by the time the first colonists came. And, and remember, um, the remaining like 10% are spread them out, and they're like in these small little tribes. It was, so it's not like there was like some grand Indian empire that the colonists immigrated to and took it over. So, and another point is that they, almost all of them were Northwest Europeans. And basically with them, with their backbreaking labor, their own sweat, their blood, and their own tears, they established the 13 colonies with their own culture, their own unique laws, their own unique cities, the, you know, their own towns, all the trade networks, everything. It w they built it from the ground up, and it's thanks to these settlers and these pioneers that America was founded. They didn't immigrate to America. They literally created the foundations of America. You know, the law was based on British common law. All of them were of Northwest European descent. The buildings were built in a specific European style. It's, it's not like they immigrated. T it's to um, America, as I mentioned. It's this is in this era of settlers and pioneers in the 1600s and most of the 1700s. This was them creating America in their own image. So now that we have established that, basically from 1607 to about 1775, we have a few million white um, white people, like white people in general, in British America, as it was called, about 80 percent of the population. So we, these people were the established foundation stock of America. And as I mentioned before, they were mostly Northwestern Europeans. They created their own country from the ground up based upon the foundations of mostly British influence. They did not immigrate. They settled the open land and created civilization themselves. This brings us to the late 1700s when America finally becomes a nation. So this is the point where every, everyone coming into America is an immigrant because they're coming into a pre-made nation. So this a nation got created... There's millions of people already there from mostly Northwest Europeans. So now, from once they once they got their revolut, once they got their freedom, what's like who's coming in now? Who now everyone who's coming into this nation is an immigrant. So, what's the first rules? What what are the first immigrant? Once they won the future war of independence, what was what was the first immigration rules that they established in the Congress? 
So who's going to be allowed to come into this new America? Well, we have to look at the first Immigration Acts. And what was the first Immigration Acts? The first Immigration Act was called the Immigration Act of 1790, which restricted immigration to, quote, freed white persons of good moral character. I, I thought we were, you know, open. You know, I thought we were, you know, oh, you know, you would, you would think that, okay, so now that we have America, they would let anyone in? Nope. We've been restricted literally just freed white persons of good moral character. So the core of it is that um, immigration could only come from freed white persons. So anyway, this was the fundamental underpinning of our immigration. All new African importation was stopped with when they banned the African slave trade in 1808. So after that point, up until the end of the Civil War, uh, America experiences natural boom in the population in terms of birth. So that's all the people who were there beforehand. So there was no more Africans coming in, and then... There, so at the beginning, especially, um, it was like 80 20, but this natural birth from the stock, you know, comp in the early 1800s built up, and there was more and more. And that's where the white population started, went from 80 to around like sitting up 85. And there was more, there was immigration from where you might think, oh, so this is where all the immigrants come from. No, they're coming, these immigrants started to come from Germany, they came from England, Scots, Irish, French, Scandinavians. The, a good solid majority were English, though, but most, you know, this is where all of them are coming from. And as we moved westward uh, and we go into industrial times, you know, we are, you know, building up um, up until the Civil War. So all throughout the 1800s, mostly it it wasn't like we were, you know, we have this restrictive immigration policy to basically favoring Europeans. Um, we weren't always open for everyone. And um and that's and basically from the natural population growth, you know, because it was high birth rates back then, that's how we're starting to get more and more Americans. So what 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 about the question of the African Americans? So in terms of the black population, blacks before America became a nation, as I mentioned, blacks made up about twenty percent of the whole population, almost all of them concentrated in the South. Before the bloody Civil War, in which hundreds of thousands of European Americans lay down their lives, Blacks were considered property, and even anti-slavery advocates, most of them wanted to be freed, but sent them back to Africa. For example, and the what you could figure out about the mindset about these Africans in America is if you know, and you're like, well, maybe they, you know, they, they were from the found, they, you know, they were from the foundation stock as well, right? So were they considered, you know, going to be Americans? Well, actually, the Supreme Court ruled in a Dred Scott case that even if a free state had, you know, if you're a black person, you were born in a free state, and you're free. You weren't considered or supposed to be an American. You weren't supposed to get citizenship, which what this now, you know, this was obvious. Everyone agrees it's a bad decision now. But what that underscores is that America was supposed to be a nation based upon Northwest Europeans, mostly of English descent. However, after the Civil War, the newly freed blacks were given citizenship. Um, but basically, since there was no African slave trade and more Europeans came and the birth rate from the previous um, settlers boomed their share of the population, you know, started dropping to like 10%. So now with that all out of the way, this leads us to the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So, you know, America's been established by, for about 100 years now. What's going on? What's the immigration status? During that time, this was the first peak boom of immigration because because of this is this is the age of rapid industrialization, urbanization and expanded ways of living. And immigrant we needed immigrants to fl you know, we 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 had, you know, we, we, we weren't like, there wasn't like a specific, like, we only want, like, um, it was basically just freed white persons as established before, but, you know, it was, this was the first time when, like, okay, maybe, uh, while there was a ton of German immigrants, a ton of you know, Northwest Europeans, this was the time when there was a bunch of Italians, Irish, Poles, Russians, Jews who came to America, this was, and they came through Ellis Island and all that, this is where a lot of, uh, non, uh, foundational Americans came in, but, Again, European still, though. Um, however, once immigration levels reached a certain point, you know this. This was when this was like when uh, the last time there was like a huge amount of foreign-born people in America. It was like fourteen percent at one point. Um, first of all, there was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is another th you know um, nail in the coffin that we're always been an open nation, a nation of immigrants. We literally banned Chinese people from coming in. There was the Immigration Act of 1903, which banned anarchists and insane people. The Immigration Act 1907, which banned people with mental and physical disabilities and infectious diseases. And then the Immigration Act of 1917, which, get this, this is what they banned. You, so they created a literacy test, and then they banned criminals, 
alcoholics, political radicals, idiots, imbeciles, prostitutes, polygamists, and contract laborers. And this accumulated into an act which defined American immigration throughout the rest of the ni- for most of the 1900s up until 1965, which is called the Immigration Act of 1924, or the Johnson Reed Act, which established the National Origins Quota, which restricted immigration entirely from Asia. It severely limited Southern and Eastern European immigration and heavily favored immigration from Northwest Europeans. The immigration rate decreased, the foreign pop- born population decreased. And what's important to know about this point in American history is that after letting in Italians, Irish, Poles, and whatnot, we immediately shut the door because we didn't need them. We didn't need more immigrants anymore, and we restricted it back to Northwest Europeans once there was no need to fulfill like a labor shortage. And once again, all the immigrants that were coming in, no matter if they were Italians or Germans, they all were coming from Europe. So to talk about what happened between that following the 1924 Immigration Act and 1965, um, just a few points on that. Um, we got rid of the strict racial requ- um There's a few things that happened. We first of all, there was um, we got rid of the Chinese Exclusion Act during World War II for the because we were fighting for the Chinese. Well, we were fighting Japan, so we wanted to help the Chinese. And so you might think, okay, now Chinese people come in. Nope, they restricted to 100 Chinese people come in every year. So um, not not necessarily. They still favored Northwest Europeans. There was. Gra- they got rid of like a strict racial requirement. So as I mentioned, they got rid of like bans on certain races from coming in. But still, um, eighty percent were they were still a, a bias towards Northwest Europeans. Like an actual like eighty percent has to come to like Germany, England, Ireland, etc. There was also things like Operation Wetback, which deported for over four hundred thousand illegal immigrants back to Mexico. Um, this um. What this, um, the act of the McWarren Walter Act of 1952, for example, is what got rid of like the strict racial requirements, but still prioritized Northwest Europeans. But speaking of that, what about what happened in 1965? Why am I talking about this here? This is 1965 is the year when everything changed, when the Hart Seller Act was signed, which fundamentally changed American immigration. And at this point, the foreign born population was down to around 4 to 5 percent. And this act fundamentally made us a nation where we did not take race or have any preferences and was completely race neutral and just based on certain skills and needs of the workforce. So from here on out, from 1965 onwards, so if history started at this point, then yes, the pro-immigration society would have a point that, that we would have allowed people to come in without regard to race or nationality or whatever. But don't be fooled. As we mentioned throughout this minute, you know, this long episode so far, the effects of this new immigration paradigm was not expected or promised to the American people. So even though they got rid of the preferences to Northwest Europeans with the Hart Seller Act, they they weren't expecting what they got. This there, Here's a quote from one of the biggest proponents of the bill, Edward Kennedy. What did he think when they were passing this? Here's a quote. Out of deference to the critics, I want to comment on what this bill will not do. First, our cities will not be flooded with a million immigrants annually. Under the proposed bill, the present level of immigration remains substantially the same. Secondly, the ethnic mix of this country will not be upset. Contrary to the change charges in some quarters, Senate Bill 500 will not inuate America with immigrants from any one country or area or the most populated and economically deprived nations of Africa and Asia. In the final analysis, the ethnic pattern of immigration under the proposed measure is not expected to change as sharply as the critics seem to think. Thirdly, the bill will not permit the entry of subversive persons, criminals, illiterates, or those with contagious diseases or serious mental illnesses. As I noted a moment ago, no immigrant visa will be issued to a person who is likely to become a public charge. The charges I have mentioned are highly emotional, irrational, and ill-foundation in fact. That was the quote. To get to the next part of our immigration story in America terms of the history we have to go to 1986 where i think you'll i think you'll recognize this story because it's happening in the modern world because of our weak, weaker immigration laws there are now there were now millions of illegal immigrants from the south mostly of latin america and and most of the new immigrants are coming from latin america and asia so there now with this new paradigm there was a grand bargain delivered by a Republican president and Democrats working together to fix this immigration problem. Now tell me if this sounds familiar. 
in exchange for about, at that time, 3 million illegals getting amnesty or citizenship, we would put more money into border enforcement, we would make it harder to hire illegals, and this would only allow legal entries from here on out. This whole modern immigration debate was settled in 1986, and yet, to this day, the same arguments are laid out in the modern debate. And what this shows is that we were lied to, and we're being lied to again. The next big immigration act which totally changed America was the Immigration Act of 1990. Um, and this was the last time we made any sort of huge legislative act to change America, um, American immigration. What this did was triple the amount of legal immigration. And from 270,000, yes, a mere 30 years ago, only a little over a quarter of a million could be admitted a year, and this was increased to 700,000. It tripled the amount of work visas. It fundamentally under, uh, uncutting American ability to compete with labor from abroad. It created the diversity emissions visa, the, T, the temporary protected status um, visa, and removed a lot of the requirements that were established for that barred entry. If Hart Seller was, say, the stab in the back for America, the Immigration Act 1990 was the final stab to the head to finally, you know, kill America for, for good. The effects we can see from this all are can be seen today. So we have opened our borders, we have loosened our requirements, and we have run this experiment for 50 years now. And what are the results? To recap, the history of the United States is a sum, in sum, is a history of explorers, settlers, and pioneers from mostly England, but also others from Northwest Europe, entering virgin and open territory that they built up with struggle, sacrifice, and sweat. And after the establishment of America after a few hundred years, they restricted immigration to freed white persons of good moral character. And up to the late 1800s, which focused America as a nation based on English common law of mostly English people with a good chunk of German, French, Scandinavian, and Scots-Irish in the mix, after that, because of increased industrialization and urbanization, we allowed more Southern and Eastern Europeans to, to fulfill the needs of the labor force, but we closed them off and banned immigration entirely from Asia and, and elsewhere. Um, and we deported hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants, and we fundamentally understood that America's, America is an English-speaking Christian nation based on English common law. This understanding of America was shattered with the Hart Seller Act of 1965, and the final death blow of unrestricted immigration came in 1990. So what are the results? What are the current trends and effects of immigration to America in the modern day? Well, here's part two of this American story. All right, so first, let's look at the numbers of immigrants that are coming in. And it's truly shocking. Currently in America, about 14%, or 44 million of our population are foreign born. This is in stark contrast to before the remaking of our immigration laws where only about 4% were foreign born. Uh, we emit over 1.1 million new residents every year. That's right, not every decade, but per year. 1.1 million per year. And this does not include the huge number of illegal immigrants. Speaking of illegal immigrants, there are about 15 million illegal immigrants who have, who have bypassed our border control. 45% of immigration comes from the Americas, mostly Mexico and Central America. 36% comes from Asia, 10% from Africa, and 7.3% come from Europe. The biggest six countries of foreign-born residents come from Mexico, China, India, the Philippines, and El Salvador. Now, and Vietnam, sorry. And a total reversal of past trends. And uh, as you can see in the, uh, the, the picture in front, these are the comparisons of the biggest immigrant group in each state compared from 1950 to 2013. So those are pretty terrible numbers all around. But what does that mean for the Americans on the ground? Well, the biggest change in numbers is what it's doing to the demographics of our nation. In 1960, according to the census, 88.6% of the population was white, not Hispanic white, I should say. In 2020, it is, it's expected to be only 60%. It's projected that the non-Hispanic white population will cease being a majority by 2045, and by 2060, almost 100 years till we what, since we diverged off course, then non-Hispanic white population is, is expected to be only at 44.2%. 
The Hispanic population will be about at 27.5%, the black population at 15%, the Asian population at 9%, with two or more races being at 6.2%. And we must ask ourselves, is this right? Was becoming a minority in our own lands part of the deal? Should the descendants become a minority in their own country? Should we fundamentally change our character from an English-speaking Christian Northwest European nation? This is happening, and we must ask if that, that is a good thing. Which leads me to the next point, why this change is harmful to our nation. The biggest question is, the future of America is, can we survive this dramatic change to the fundamental character of our nation? Because if we look throughout the history of mankind, multi-ethnic empires just fall apart. If you look at Yugoslavia, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or the Russian Empire... If you look at the current struggle between Israel and Palestine, the struggle between Pakistan and India, or after the the you know like the after the, the civil wars in Africa after the British and the French left, perhaps America can overcome the odds. But I ask you, do you think people are becoming less race focused and more colorblind? Because it seems that the more of one group there is, there is more of a focus on ethnic based interests. And there's more of a struggle and divergence in understanding. You know, perhaps maybe we, we will all see ourselves as just American. You know, but it's going to be like, I'm a Hispanic American or I'm a black American. And it's not just like we're both all Americans. You know, um, so we have to ask, you know, is this something that's, you know, can we overcome? Like, are we becoming, as we become more diverse, um, we have to ask yourself, do you think we're becoming more like just race neutral? Or is there more, how do you think throughout your, the, the years we're becoming more obsessed with race and more race focused. You know, I think that when we were more homogeneous, we weren't talking about race as much. You know, diversity, that leads me to another point. Diversity destroys social cohesion. You know, have you ever felt that, like, for example, that you just don't belong in this area? You know, it's been proven throughout all nations that homogeneous nations are the most best at fostering that social cohesion because the members you know, look, speak, and act like each other. And that's just natural human tribalism. You can't, you know, legislate tribalism, a natural part of human existence, out of, you know, you know, just out of, out of it. You can't legislate it away. You know, we've, blacks and, as I mentioned in our history, blacks and whites have been in America for that about the same amount of time. Yet we still diverge in like, you know, we might be Americans, but we're also different than just, we might be all Americans, but we're also, oh, I'm a black American. I'm a white American. It's not like a, you know, we still see ourselves as different, even though we've been together since the beginning. So why bring in more types of people would that change? Because, um, you know, I fear greatly that America might be headed to balkanization, where we split about based on race. And it's already happening. In fact, um, not only not only is this a hypothetical about balkanization, but it's happening despite the, you know, because despite the constant efforts to destroy every what is seen as a too much white area, People still self-segregate based on race. If you look at cities, you can see that certain ethnic groups cluster around their own kind. You see this especially prevalent in Europe, where whole sections of the city, you know, are ruled by foreign people and culture. So, this is, you know, we're, we have to ask, can we survive? And if we do, then we're going to be, it's going to be, it looks like the odds aren't that great for us if we, to survive it. Speaking of diversity, diversity destroys social cohesion, as I mentioned before. Um, for example, if you look at a, um, if you look at a Harvard study based off, um, I think the man was called Robert Putman. Diversity destroys social trust. People volunteer less. They vote less. Just intuitively, you know, just think intuitively. You know that differences make you know, like you know, like for example, the saying is diversity makes us stronger, and you know that just intuitively that just makes no sense whatsoever. Like, who would you relate to? Someone who speaks, acts, looks, at, and likes the same things as you do, or not? And I think we all know the answer to that. The big question we need to ask ourselves, and this applies especially relevant for Europe, you know, we have a unique culture, a unique identity, a unique way of life, and we want to preserve it. We don't want to feel like strangers and become a minority. We have a fundamental right to exist, and we want to keep it that way. So no matter if the immigrants are all good and perfect, and are net positive in every single way, it does not matter because we want to remain who we are. But the effects of immigration are bad, and we're not just sacrificing our country and, and identity for something better like bigger GDP. We're getting a worse deal. 
So the first effect that I wanted to touch upon is the effects it has on our lives, and it affects it in a very real way. And that's the immigrant effects on the labor force. So throughout American history, many different groups were opposed to immigration, and one of the biggest opponents was organized labor. And there's a reason for this. Have you ever thought, like, why are all these corporations spending hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying to get looser immigration deals and extended guest worker programs? That's right, mass international corporations who only care about profit, they want looser immigration. It seems kind of a bit of a contradictory for the usually left-wing types to support this. Because uh, if you have immigrants who pour over the border and they work for lower wages, you undercut the wages of the native workers. And so, like, why is that, though? Think about it. When the opposite is true, a worker short, when there's a worker shortage, for example, employers are forced to raise their wages to attract employees. The more people that are in the system, the more they want the jobs, and thus there's less competition and wages don't rise. Is it any wonder that since we opened the floodgates that Americans have seen their wages stagnate? What these guest worker programs do is allow multi-billion dollar companies to hire, say, an Indian programmer for $80,000, which works well for the Indian guy, but not the American computer programmer who is worth $120,000. So we must stop... So, so basically what he needs to do is drop what he's paid to compete with his lower-wage Indian programmer. This is true for low wages, and it is true for high wages. The only reason why unskilled immigration is worse because they also get on welfare and usually do more crime. But even the so-called skilled immigration still undercuts many wages for high-skilled Americans. The American worker faces lower wages, job competition, and, less cohesive, and a less cohesive workforce because of immigration. And if you want to be truly pro-worker, you must be for immigration restriction. Another thing that I should mention um, when I was talking about jobs is, is when we talk about welfare itself. Now, we are a bit better at this in terms of the immigrants than in Europe, where, than in Europe, where, if, because if you look at Europe, holy cow, like almost all their, most of their welfare goes to immigrants. Um, in America, we're a little bit better at this than others from what I've seen. Um, it's truly a basket case there, but in America, it's a bit better, but it's still not good. Now, here's the what the facts say. So there's basically, now, in terms of welfare state itself, there's a saying, as old as time, that you either have a welfare state and a border, or no welfare state, or no border. Um, as I mentioned earlier, to have a welfare state requires a stable and homogeneous society that trusts each other. For example, if you're willing to lose half your income for the betterment of your countrymen, you know, you sure as hell need to trust and relate to your countrymen, you know? Well, if, well, the welfare state also requires a giant chunk of the population to pay in, and the idea is that when we can spend on the sick, the elderly, the children, and maybe for a grand, more bigger project like infrastructure and research and development, and that's like the idea, you know, that you know we give a part of our income for the betterment of our society. But what happens when you have more and more people pay less taxes and take more out in welfare? The welfare state collapses, obviously. So what are the stats on welfare exactly? So overall, 63% of non-native households use at least one type of welfare program versus 45, um, or 45% uh, of non-native household. Now, if you want to break down the specifics, 45% of non-native households use food stamps, 50% use Medicaid, 4% use housing benefits. They are also entitled to free public education and the school meals that accompany them. So even the most best country for immigration who don't use as much welfare as immigrants in the, in the European counterpart, they still use more than the native population, and it is much worse in Europe. Now, there's a big argument that goes around too. It's like, okay, but speaking of jobs and welfare, okay, they might take jobs, they might use welfare, but what about how, how is that possible? How, how is it that they can have a job and also welfare? So let me answer that. You can still work and still take welfare, retard. It's called the working poor. You can work full time and still not make enough, and you could still only make enough money, still not make enough money where you could still qualify for welfare. So you could take a job and still collect welfare. It's not like oh well, they could use welfare or they could use get a job. They they could do both. So it's like a not it's a misunderstanding of the situation to make that argument. Oh yeah, I also have to argue about one more thing about the services that people use. So, the U.S. population is expected to reach 400 million later this century, in a few decades, actually. And it's almost all solely because of immigration. 
So knowing this, knowing that our population is exploding, we have to ask ourselves a question. Why should there be more people? You know, more immigrants means more housing popping up, more cars on our highways and roads. This will require bigger class sizes. They take up critical health care resources. More people means we need to support them. And don't we have enough people already? Why do we need to build more roads and have more cars on our streets and have more children in our classes and have more housing on more land? You know, why indeed? You know, I say we are full and we are fine. And if population slows down, so be it. Also, let me address quickly the argument that they will pay for our social services. By definition, since they take more welfare out of the system, less will be going to social services for older Americans and Americans in need. So it's like, oh, they'll pay for our pensions. Actually, they're going to take more out of the pension system because the money that would uh, be saved in a trust fund or, you know, being a surplus would be given to these people who are taking out more than, um, than the native counterparts. So the next effect of immigration that I'm going to talk about is crime. Now, firstly, as I mentioned before, we have over 15 million illegal immigrants in this country. Tons came after we legalized the first few million, and they are waiting for a Democratic president to legalize them all. So we must fundamentally ask ourselves, are we a country or not? Because if we can't control our borders, then we are not a country at all. So by definition, an illegal immigrant breaks our laws and is committing a crime. Along with this, crime varies depending, uh, so crime in terms of immigration in general, it would depend on a mix of factors, depending on the, the origin of the immigrant, their education level, their socioeconomic status. Now, studies are a mix on the matter, but the reason why native crime rate even comes close to immigrant crime rate is because of the huge black population in America. This also applies to the welfare thing, by the way. If you look at um, the non-Hispanic white population, the welfare rates are not as uh, if you if you combine the native population, which is the native black, white, Hispanic, and Asian population, it's still welfare is not as bad as it is from an immig- from all the immigrants. Now, obviously, you could pick and choose. Like some immigrants don't do as much welfare as natives. Uh, same thing with the crime. But generally speaking, um, the reason why uh, Amer- na- the native rate is close is because of. Uh, like usually, and for crime specifically, as we're talking about, because specifically of the black population, uh, why? So um, we now, so basically, as I mentioned, um, immigrants are also um, overrepresented in the criminal justice system. I will admit that the biggest disparities are in uh, drug offenses, petty theft, immigration fraud, welfare fraud, tax fraud, etc. Um, so it's not like you know they're all you know it's not like they're all murderers, right? But that's where where a lot of the discrepancy comes in in crime. But we must ask ourselves that even when when an, when an immigrant does commit a violent and or a felonious offense against an American, that is an American life that was lost because of our negligence. Even if only one American gets murdered or raped or succ- succumbs to a drug overdose or gets robbed by an immigrant, that crime is on the leader's hands because we said, okay, we're going to invite this person in. And if they harm one of our Americans, then even if it's just one out of 100,000 who commits a violent crime, that one crime is a stain on and a, and a backstab to the people of America. Oh yeah, speaking of uh, past organizations that used to oppose immigration, various environmental groups such as the Sierra, Cl- 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 Sierra Club used to oppose immigration, and for good reasons as well. The more people you have on, you know, have in your country the more it strains the environment, and that's just a simple fact of life. As I mentioned before, there's more cars on the, are on the road, they use electricity for their new homes, there's more construction that's put on the green spaces for the, you know, these new, because these new people need homes to live in, right? So they, they need to construct more housing. You know, the left wing talks a big game about how we need to regulate how a person consumes, you know, electricity in their homes, how they could their ways, their cars, the way they transport themselves. We have to regulate how they eat, how they work you know, et cetera, et cetera. But what if, what if they simply just weren't here at all? You know, we can simply just not have a person add extra pollution and CO2 into our country, and this would help tremendously for our environment. Also, as of the making of this video, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And what we can learn is that loose borders lead to plague outbreaks, and we must be able to restrict our borders to prevent plague outbreaks along with Along with this, it's not just like coronavirus too, but also, you know, a few years ago, do you guys remember the outbreaks of tuberculosis and measles? 
You know, it's not necess- it wasn't like strictly the anti vac Karens that were doing it. It was the immigrants bring- coming over with the diseases and spreading them to the population. So in effect, immigration control is disease control and the one of the most pro-environment things you could ever do. The last effect of immigration is I want I want to focus on our the democratic process itself. As we become more diverse, we are effectively becoming a country where tribalism is running rampant. You know, white identity politics on the right and anti-white, non-white identity politics on the left. You know, for example, I, I mean, th- this is this is this video was created during the 2020 election. Have, have you guys seen the Democratic like primaries? Like, we are doing this for the blacks. This is for the Latinos. You know, reparations. You know, are coming into the mainstream. You know, open borders, race-based affirmative action, and you know, immigrants strongly vote Democratic. If you want to know why places like California and Virginia turn blue, it's because of demographics. Why is Texas and Georgia trending blue? Demographics. They vote based on ethnic interests, and the whole Democratic Party is an anti-white drive where they promise to tax the white native population, who actually pay most taxes, and give out these freebies to all the non-white voters, uh, in a way like a race-based spoil system. Um, so in exchange for welfare, they get votes. It's simple as that. So, for example, and then not just like, you know, what about like gun rights and free speech? But like, what about the Democratic norms? So while 59% of white Americans support protecting the right to gun ownership, 71% of blacks, 62% of Hispanics, and 77% of Asians support gun control. What about hate speech? 62% of blacks and 50% of Hispanics support criminalizing hate speech. Um, 54% of Asians, 68% of blacks, and 75% of Hispanics would prefer a bigger government and more services than less government and less social services. Demographic change is going to turn America into a one-party state with Democrats using white people as taxpayer funds to give good handouts to non-whites and continually push race-based laws that give preference from schooling to work to social services to non-whites and non-native U.S. citizens over the native population. So we know the effects of immigration and the reasons against it, and now we must come up with a set of solutions to fix our immigration system so that it works for the nation, the people, and the worker. So before we start on like certain policy proposals to fix our current immigration system, we must ask what are the fundamental assumptions that we are working on when we are trying to package together a set of policies for immigration reform. So here there's four types. One, that borders are real and should be secure and that the nation has the right to control who comes in and that immigration is a privilege and not a right. Two, that illegal immigration should be combated and minimized and fought as much as possible. Three, that an immigration system should respect and to take and take into account the fundamental character of the nation and try not to alter it in a drastic way, and should focus on the needs of the American worker and the American people before anyone else. And lastly, number four, that it is the duty of the immigrants to assimilate to America, not just coexist in, in a multicultural fashion, not just simply integrate, but assimilating fully with their previous identities cast off. All right, so now that we know the fundamental assumptions that we're working on, like the base underlying foundations, what are the goals of these policies? They're not just out of thin air. Like, what's the purpose of those policies um, of our patriotic immigration reform package? And these are the assumptions. The first, um, this, or the goals. The first goal um, is to preserve the fundamental character of the American nation as a Christian, English speaking nation based on Western civilizational values, British common law, and also promoting a common national identity with successful and thorough Im- assimilation pro- policies. The second goal is to establish clear and strict limits and standards of emissions for immigrants so that those who move into the United States are of the highest character and fulfill a need in our nation. And lastly, the third goal is a system that protects our borders, minimizes illegal immigration, and puts the needs of the American nation, worker, people, and environment first. So the next 20 policies achieve those goals and are grounded in our historic background, address the problems we laid out with our current immigration system, and are rooted in those assumptions we laid out that achieved the goals we listed before. So I introduce to you the Patriotic New Deal, a set of 20 policies that a mainstream candidate in America can run on to fix our immigration system. So let's start, shall we? 
The first policy that underpins all this is a total and complete immigration moratorium for 10 years as we transition to the new immigrant immigration system. A moratorium essentially is a fancy word meaning a halt or a stop to all new admissions of immigrants. And I'm talking a total halt for a 10-year span of time. What this will do is give us a breathing space and enough time so we can transition into our new system, which I will explain in later policies. For now, we are a full country. We are taking over 1.1 million every year, and we need a halt, a pause for a moment as we restructure our system and give America much needed breathing space. The second policy uh, is a firm annual legal immigration cap of 100,000 per year. Along with this, I would bring back the national origins quota and this is how the new system will be allocated based on the quota system. 50% of the 100,000 quota every year will come from Europe, which will include Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. 25% are from Asia and the Middle East. 12.5% will be allocated for Latin America um, and you know South America and Mexico. And the other 12.5% will come from Africa. What this will allow is a regulated and firm limit of people who can come in and become citizens, so we can end the era of mass immigration. Um, if you take 100,000, which is about on regular historic levels, and compare what we have now, that's a 90% cut. And it and it actually would give us a, it wouldn't drastically, it, not only would the, what this would do also, as I mentioned, is protect the fundamental character of our European heritage. Um, if I had to put it into simple terms, for example, like what this would do, um, like say the 12,500 slots for citizenship would be available for all the countries of Latin America and South America. So 100,000 total for the whole world. And then it's ba they're distributed based on like continents. Now, how exactly does one get selected to one of these slots? Well, glad you ask, because that gets addressed in the next policy. So the third policy, what this would do is scrap the green card and replace it with what I call a blue national card, which would be given to those selected out of the quota. But who exactly gets this blue national card? Well, it would be based on a points-based system. So what are some of the things that people could get points on when they apply? Some of the things that we will consider is, you know, have you worked in the United States before? What is, have you studied in the United States before? What's your education level? What skills and work experience do you have? You know, what is your English proficiency? You know, do you got any trade skills? Do you have a spouse? Do you have an immediate family member? You know, anyone can apply and fill out an application listing and proving their skills, qualifications, and everything above. But only the ones who accumulate the most amount of points will be selected to get a blue national card. And there's a hard limit, as I said, of 100,000 per year, with specific quota, quota limits for each continent, as mentioned before. Um... What I um, another alternative system to this, um, I'm, I'm either or, but I, this is what I went with. But one thing is, there's there could be a quota system. And there's a limit, but instead of it just being whatever, it's like what specific need do you like fulfill? Like maybe you know we need doctors. It's not just like you could get you just whoever's the most qualified. Maybe it's not even we don't even need people at all. We just need like oh. We need a certain amount of doctors. We need a certain amount of people who have a, maybe you have a spouse and you get, you know, in that way. Um, either or, you know, I'm in favor of kind of like either it's just based off, there's a 100,000 limit and we just based off the needs of the labor force or it's a more of a accumulation of the best skills. I'm, I'm, either, I'm open to both. Now, what else about this blue national card? So once you're selected, what happens? Well, you get a permanent residence card, like a green card. And what you would do, you would have to hold this blue national card for five years. During that time, you are tracked by the government. And basically, they're looking at, are you getting a job? Do you have your own home? Are you not collecting welfare? Are you, have you been involved in crime? If you start becoming a drag on society, you are stripped of this card and deported. And at the end of the five years, you're given a civics test, a history test, and an English literacy test, which includes speaking, reading, and writing. And you must pass all these tests. And if you do, you take your allegiance and get United States citizenship. So the fourth policy that I would bring back is the good moral character side of our immigration policy that we've had or we did have for a while. So what does that mean? That means things that might slide if you're a citizen do not slide when you're trying to apply to become come into this country. 
we are setting up high standards for you admissions. So what are some moral failings that would deny you getting citizenship or a blue national card? Well, and not just moral failings, but like, are you going to be a burden? It's like, for example, a moral failing was like, do you, are you, have you done petty crime or do you have a criminal history? Are you a drug user or an alcoholic? Are you an anarchist or a communist? Have, have, do you use welfare? Are you a prostitute? You know, kind of like things that, you know, maybe you might be a whore, but that's not necessarily a crime when you're a citizen. But, you know, we don't want more whores coming in, for example. So that's why if you're if you're a prostitute, you are not going to come in. Now, there's just a lot of those things. And other things are not necessarily moral failings, but we don't want these types of th people. People who have a mental or physical disability. People who are literally just illiterate. Um, people who, um, you know, think uh, if they have an infectious disease. So what this does is ensure that not only do you have skillful or equal, you know, you could be the most, you know, you know, you could, on paper, you could be like a very hard, you know, someone who um, speaks good English and uh, has good qualifications in, jo in jobs and, and everything like that uh, and skills. But, you know, you have to also have a good moral character. You can't be like, you know, some radical um, disabled person. Like we're not going to, you know, even if you're perfect, there has to be a moral thing. So there's the practical, skillful things that we take into account and also this good moral character stuff that gets into account when, if you want to, that is considered when you're trying to apply to become a, for the Blue National Card and a citizen. The fifth policy is a $30 billion border security infrastructure project funded through a remittance tax, which will finally secure our borders. What this fund will go to is building fences and walls where needed. It would also upgrade our border checkpoints. It would up give drones, sound radar to like figure out who's like going underground. It would be a patriotic fund used to build and maintain and secure America's frontier and also hopefully put a stop to border jumpers and illegal immigration. Now, as I said, a big part of, for example, Trump's campaign is building a wall. We what this would do, what's different between that is that this would look at everything. You know, maybe there's a wall we need here, maybe some things need fences, some places need more upgraded of the um, of the border checkpoints, just whatever the the border patrol needs to uh, secure the border. And this is what every year, people, it's a $30 billion remediance fund. The sixth policy, and it kind of goes hand in hand with the thirty the remediance tax as before, um, what the, the revenue from that would, uh, uh, and also what I hope to also get is revenue from decreasing our wars overseas. All this money would go to triple the amount of ICE agents to enforce immigration in, in the interior from 20,000 currently to 60,000. Um, this would encourage immigration, enforce immigration law in our nation. Um, this, the fund would also dra dra drastically increase the personnel and equipment for the Customs and Border Patrol to deal with the traffic and movement of peoples between our borders. It would also increase funding to expand the amount of immigration judges the deten and detention centers so we can process immigration claims faster. This new funding would also come with expanded powers for ICE to arrest and prosecute illegal immigration and em the employers who hire them. We would first of all focus mostly on criminals, repeat border jumpers, and welfare users. Um, but we so we will deport hundreds of thousands that we have in the past. Now, this and also this also goes without saying we're going to repeal the DACA program and everything. What this would do, um, this would have an effect in cracking down on illegal immigration, um, knowing. Um, you know, we're not going to give any citizenship to illegal. So they're like, oh, well, if they're going to actually deport us, we're not going to keep on coming. Now, I understand the logistics might not entail. We not, might not be able to deport millions of people, uh, but we could deport lots of them as we have in the past. And what this would do is, and with focusing on the worst types, and then what this would do is people would just naturally self-deport. But you have to have a strong, like, people are like living in fear that they're, they'll be deported, so they'll just leave. They can't just be like, oh, maybe if I wait, I'll get citizenship. The seventh policy would make English the national language of the United States, the official national language. So not only, what this would mean is not only would it recognize the historical importance that English is, that it's our spoken tongue, um, not just like a recognition of it, but this would also require that all government documents are done in English, that all signs, all spoken words, etc. during in the government are done in English. Uh, it would ensure that all voting will be done in English, that all schooling will be done in English. 
And, um, you know, local and state governments can recognize other languages as well if they want, but they must recognize English and federally as a whole, na in, in a general sense for a whole nation, we only see English. As I mentioned before, there will be an English literacy test as well, given where an, ap where an applicant for citizenship must have an intermediate skills in speaking, reading, and writing English. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, those with, who already have English skills are given extra points. The eighth policy is to make E-Verify mandatory nationwide. Now, E-Verify is a system where employers verify if their workers are legal or not with the government, and we all have to make sure that, that its use is mandatory. We would use ICE power to raid and sweep businesses that hire illegal labor, and we would put more funding into E-Verify and the fun and the funds to expand the, the, those, you know, this E-Verify would be done from the massive fines we would level on business owners who hire illegals. And oh yeah, we're also going to make sure hiring an illegal immigrant would be a felony offense. So this would ensure that the biggest magnet for immigration, that being jobs, is cut and illegal immigra immigrants would just simply self-deport. This is another way to combat illegal immigration and help jobs go straight to U.S. citizens. The ninth policy would create a public charge rule. So if you have to use any public welfare program, you are barred from becoming a citizen and deported if you have a blue national card. You know, speaking of welfare, I would also create an immigration czar whose sole purpose would coordinate all the different federal departments in crushing illegal immigration and snuffing out welfare fraud. This would be another hit, making sure that our welfare cash goes only to American citizens and it stops enticing immigrants to come for welfare purposes. So basically what this is, does is combat another source of illegal immigration. It also um, combats um, like, hey, like just because you're, um, if you come here, you're going to be barred. You're, you're not going to be able to just get it welfare immediately like they are in Europe. There's going to be a lot of um, – and if you're going to have to use welfare, you're just not going to get citizenship. So this will ensure that those who come in aren't going to be abusing our resources. The tenth policy would fundamentally change our current family-based migration paradigm. It would abolish so-called chain migration and not allow you to just fast track someone into the country just because you are related to them. Now, having said that, having a relative or a spouse in the United States gives you extra points, but does not fast track you. And points are only given to immediate family members. This would close the loophole where if you're able to come in, you can just fast track away for others to come in into the states. So basically, it's not like, okay, I'm in, I got in, and then now I'm just going to take as much people as I can in because I'm... Now that I'm a citizen, I could take in as much people as I can, and this gives them citizenship, and then they could apply. So it that's why it's called chain migration. They just bring their whole families over, and we need to end that. And it's going to be not based on just, oh, someone's related. You could just come in. The 11th policy would abolish birthright citizenship and dual citizenship. You know, you may only become a you only you may only become a automatic U.S. citizen if you are born to two legal American citizens. This would halt so-called birth tourism. Um, and the reason why I say two legal American citizens, because if you only make it where only one of the parents has to be a citizen, you will have you will have scammers trying to impregnate or be impregnated by an American, and thus their children would be citizens. This would restrict automatic citizenship to those born to legal U.S. citizens. Now, in terms of abolishing dual citizenship, I mean, I think this is just a, a duh thing. I mean, this would require that, I mean, it's just common sense. You can only be loyal to one country. And those who can become citizens basically must renounce any citizenship or loyalty to their old countries when they are – when they're – if you're on a blue national card, you have to renounce all your past citizenships. The 12th policy is kind of simple, and basically it's to simply abolish the diversity visa lottery. It's probably one of the most asinine parts of our immigration policy. Basically just granting our – giving out our citizenship like – or, you know, or visas like candy. So because your people – just because your people don't come to America enough, you know, uh, does not mean that, that does not grant them enough extra privileges to come in here. So basically, it's just to abolish it entirely. The thirteenth policy it gets a little bit more complicated. It's kind of broad too, and this deals directly with the work visa slash guest worker programs. There needs to be a strike balance between the needs of the market, such as like agricultural temporary workers who are seasonal, and just and just low wage immigration visas. What I would do, I would abolish all low-skilled immigrant immigrant visas and limit drastically the amount of visas given to so-called high-skilled immigrants. I would be more more flexible in the amount of visas I would give out to those who want to simply travel here or study here or do like a cultural exchange program. Um, 
but basically, um, what we need to do is that um, instead of just being like, oh, you could just um, hire anyone you want, you know, we have to strike like who needs, you know, like what's the needs of the economy, and like we have to like what's the targeted based needs of the economy. But it's not just like, but it can't just be a, um, work visas can't just be a way where employers could be like, okay, I want to hire a, a foreigner because they will be less, I could pay them less than a native. Um, so there's to be a balance, but right now our current policy, as I would mention, like H-1Bs and such, I would drastically limit them. And I would be a little bit more okay with like studying and, um, you know, people who want to like travel here or do like some sort of culture exchange or whatever. But it's like when you're working here, fundamentally, this is th this is to ensure that employers don't abuse the um, guest worker programs so that they um, they don't abuse them. So it, it, this protects the American worker from um, low wage foreign labor. The 14th policy, I mean, we're, get, we're getting a lot there. <laughs> So the 14th policy would implement and fully roll out our entry exit system for visa holders and have mandatory biometric screening for all the visas. I would also have those who obtain a blue national card or a U.S. visa to have the government track their financial information. And what this, these steps will do is ensure we crack down on the other way people skirt immigration law, which is visa overstays. With those that overstay getting a notice, and after one month, if if no reason is given, like, oh, I was, let's say they were kidnapped or something. Okay, we get it. But, um, but it, it, if, if there's like no reason, you just overstayed. And after we give you a notice, and after one month, you're barred from coming back into the United States ever again. So there's that. All right, our 15th immigration policy. What this is do is also a bit broader. It's to focus on reforming our broken refugee system. It's currently a giant gaping hole in our whole immigration system. It's basically where basically people could post, pass through multiple safe countries, apply for asylum, and while the process is going through, you can just disappear or you're able to stay and you can stay forever and eventually get citizenship. First, I would rewrite our rules to who could get asylum. To basically, in effect, is if you pass, even if you pass through just one safe country, you are disregarded from becoming an asylum seeker. So, for example, if only Canada, if Canada breaks down and they apply in America, that's fine. But if you're from, say, Guatemala and you pass through Mexico and you're and and not apply for asylum in Mexico, then your asylum claim would be rejected. If you want to apply, you must apply in your country of origin at the embassy, and after a strict and vigorous background check, you're given an asylum card, which is reviewed every two years, and and to ensure that. You know, and while you're on the asylum card, you have to get a job. You can't get welfare, and if you do a crime, and you, and and be sure you don't do any crime. Once conditions back home improve, you are sent back. And while you have an asylum card, it's basically impossible for you to apply for a blue national card or a visa. So this would strike the balance between this would rewrite our refugee system so that refugees can't just abuse it, and then we generally get the people fleeing persecution, but also this would ensure people who claim to be fleeing persecution are sent back to their homes or to their countries instead of going straight to, um, it's just an easier way to apply for citizenship. So it closes that loophole. The 16th policy would abolish the temporary protected status system. Um, this is a horrendously abused system, um, which we need to abolish because, because we, it, take this, we have people today who have been here since the 90s. Um, this isn't temporary. This is just the way people. We just grant them, you know, just oh, you're temp. You're, we're gonna allow you to be temporary protected, and then just stay here. You know, they never get sent back. If you want to apply for asylum, you must do through the regular asylum system, not through a fast tracked, you know, abusive abuse system where you could just come in and just never leave. The seventeenth immigration policy would require all blue national and visa holders to get mandatory private health insurance before they come to America as they will not be covered under universal health care, except for like if they get hit by a car and then they have to get emergency treatment. Before they come, a requirement is that they must purchase a health plan so that if they get sick while you know they're here, they can be covered and the U.S. taxpayers don't have to fund their public health care. It's kind of like the system they have in Belarus and a little bit in other countries. So you have to get private health care um, and not use public health care if you want to come here as an immigrant. The 18th policy 
would make immigration a federal issue. I would give a few months for cities and counties and states to lift their so-called sanctuary city or county or state policy, and basically those who do not want to comply with this federal order would get raided and arrested by federal authorities. This is a federal issue, not a state or local one. Think of it as like if a like say this like California decided to negotiate like we're at war with like China and then they start negotiating with a separate peace deal with China. This is not the, in their authority to do so, and this is strictly a federal authority which has been uh, upheld by the Supreme Court. It's in the Constitution, um, et cetera, et cetera. The nineteenth policy would actually be pretty liberal of me if I do say so myself. But during the five years when they have a blue national card and they're like working out trying to like become citizens, I would have a cultural, like, um, enhancement initiative in the State Department that would help those who become ci- who are trying to become citizens to assimilate. And basically, the way you do that is expose them and have them have experience with the American way of life. And this would also be in a conjunction and work with state and local authorities. You know, you would have them interact with other Americans, in- enjoy the American holidays, visit famous sites, work with them, you know, they'll work in community projects. Also, what this would include is language classes and programs, financial management skills, history and civics classes, and workplace training. Basically, it's just a way to bolster um, integration measures and help new citizens actually become better Americans. The 20th and last policy would focus on allowing recent immigrants to voluntarily repatriate back to their countries of origin. It would not be forced... Though, like, for, but but if I was like a country in Europe, if I was Denmark, I would force all non Danes to deport. Um, I would, you know, so I would acquire there. But in America, I would allow immigrants. Um, they'd be paid a little bit, and they would fly back to their country of origin on the condition that they forfeit their right to ever becoming a citizen again. So if they feel like, eh, America isn't for me, they could go back to their own country. So in this video, I broke down the real history of immigration to the United States the effects of the modern-day immigration system has on our nation, and I wrote out a set, set of policies that would help fix it and restore a sense of order to our immigration system. Remember, every state has a right to control their borders, and every people have a right to exist in self-determination and keep their way of life. Never forget that. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, be sure to like and subscribe, and share this video around with all your friends. And if you really liked it, be sure to check out my Patreon. So aim high, wander on, from America, with Russian love.